Chapter 13, Problem 24. In this particular case, you are asked to calculate the risk return trade off. Now, you are given the cash flows. I'll focus on, on year one. You're given the cash flows for year one, the three of them 65, 80, and 95. You're given the probability of 20, 60, 20. And what you do with that is you calculate the average of that. So you take 20% of the 65, you take 60% of the 80, and you take 20% of the 95, and you wind up with D bar, which is 80. It doesn't show you. So I'll take a moment here just to type this in. So 65 times 0.2 plus 80 times 0.6 plus 5 times 0.2 is equal to 80. Now, when your distribution is even, and what I mean by that is you have 20, 60, 20, so it's even on both sides, your number will always be the middle. So if it was 30, 40, 30, it would still be 80. So whatever the middle number is, just as a hint. All right. Now, so you've now found the average. You take the expected cash flow of 65 or the, or the forecasted and you mind it subtractive t minus D bar, which is the expected cash flow. So you simply go D minus D bar. You want it with minus 15. You want it with zero and you pl plus 15. So then you take that number and you square it. So the minus 15 squared is 225. Zero is obviously zero squared. And positive 15 is also 225. You then multiply it by the probability again. And you get the 20, 60, 20. So take the 225, multiply it by 20%, and you get 45. You continue and you get a total of 90. And then you take the square root of that. What does that represent? That's the risk. The higher the fluctuation or standard deviation, the greater the risk. So when you found the 90, you actually found the variance, if you remember that from statistics class. So you take the square root to get the standard deviation of 9.49. And you can see you would do the same thing for the standard deviation for year five and the standard deviation for year six, uh, 10. So in this particular case, you can see that the flatter the distribution, the flatter the distribution, the more risk there is. So you have 9.49 units of risk for one year, 21.21 units of risk for two years, and 30.98 units of risk for 10 years. I think I said two years, I meant five years. Now, what is something that you already know is the further you try to predict or look into the future, the more risk there is. So do you know what you're going to be doing in 10 minutes from now? Probably. 10 days from now? Mm, less likely. 10 years from now, a very wide range of possibilities exist those to what you're going to do in 10 years. You might think you're going to know, but the further you go into the future, the less likely you are to know exactly what you're going to be doing, or you might also want to view it as the higher the level of risk. So that's how, in this particular case, we can mathematically prove this. And if you want to find out which is the best option, because D-bar is always 80, you would take the 9.49, divide it by 80, and that would give you something called coefficient of variation. And so the D-bar is the same, so all you have to do is look at the level of risk. If D-bar changes, then you would take the standard deviation, divide it by D-bar, and you get coefficient of variation. And the lower the number, the better, because that is literally the risk is the denominator, sorry, is the numerator, and the return is the denominator. 
So you take risk divided by return to find out whether the trade-off is acceptable or not. Now that's not in this particular question. So if I've confused you, I apologize, but that's not necessary because D bar is the same. If D bar changes, you need to calculate V, which is standard deviation divided by D bar. And the lower number is better. All right. Thank you for listening.